Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Aaron Blashus, and uh, I'm a group product manager for ESX. I've been working at uh, VMware for um, this is this will be my eighth year. Um, <clears throat> and over the past couple of months, uh, the team in ESX. Okay, I guess first, um, how many people saw the keynote today? Now, how many people stayed to the end where Kit and Ray actually talked about? Okay, that's a pretty good number. Okay. So that little piece on the bottom where they were talking about um, uh, Photon Machine, my team at ESX has been integral into creating that, to finding out what pieces of ESX you can use um, and optimize for, for running uh, containers and doing that whole VM uh, is a container, a container is a VM orchestration at the bottom. So, what I've attempted to do is uh, put this, do this together as a high-level introduction since it's the first day for some of the strategies and things that we'll be talking about. We're going to go over a few concepts of the keynote in detail. We're going to review some of the strategies around um, cloud-native applications at a high level and the products that are coming out. Um, we're going to discuss how the customers can leverage their current investments to deliver the next generation of business critical applications and why people that are in uh, VMware IT and operations should care about these things. Um, those of you that are coming in, I know that uh, this was hard to find. I actually had to leave an hour early just to get here. Um, and so I know that there's lunch going on. So just you know, feel free to trickle in and come on up to the top so people, as they get in late, uh, can, uh, can sit in the back. OK, don't take pictures. Nothing I say necessarily means that we're going to build it or ship it, et cetera. So <clears throat> new business imperatives. So applications are changing. I struggled with putting this one actually on the slide because it's self-evident. Anybody who has worked with applications, built a server, et cetera, knows that applications are always changing. Uh, the delivery cycle, though, is what is, is what is actually making it so that this remains true and relevant again. The traditional value companies deliver is shifting to software in, in ways that you might not necessarily expect. <clears throat> and it goes way beyond typical cloud services that you experience every day. So for instance, you expect software to uh, assist with your content delivery system from Apple or Netflix. Salesforce, right? Salesforce is a cloud platform that's SaaS. It's, it's actually built on software, obviously. You interact with it exclusively through software, so that's what you expect. On the other hand, John Deere is a, tra is a tractor company. This actually example will be used many times because a few years ago this was a completely eye-opening, well not completely, but it was definitely an eye-opening experience for those of us that work with John Deere. They were transforming into simply a manufacturing company into a manufacturing company and a software company. The sheer number of applications that John Deere builds is astounding. And the reason that they do that is, is so that their tractors can drive themselves. So that, they can get the opt um, so that they can optimize how much seed goes down per square foot anywhere in the world. So that they can know that this amount of fertilizer needs to go down based on drought conditions or how much rain is going in. And, and all of this gets aggregated up and then data analytics help improve year over year uh, crop yields. Sonos, right? Sonos is actually is an audio company that you interact with on your iPhone. They build speakers for your house, but is it an audio company or is it a software company? And then there's other examples like Tesla. Tesla recently um, put out a software update uh, over the World Wide Web that made their car, that improved the, by a measurable amount the zero to 60 time on most of their automobiles. Right? That is the power of how software is actually interacting with companies. And, what, uh, and what, we're, what we're trying to do is to say, hey, you know what? This shift um, from traditional monolithic layered applications to cloud native applications is empowered by IT. Right? It's empowered by the people that, uh, that have been running VMware for a long time. And it's with these new existing app, uh, uh, and, and what you need to do is IT needs to be able to take their existing infrastructure and be able to leverage it for existing applications, what we would call a more traditional or monolithic application, and also be able to support cloud-native applications that are built on microservices and containers. Right? 
successful de DevOps and application developers and IT administrators will need to be more agile. They will need to be able to understand and embrace how microservices can impact their business in positive ways. And many of these applications that are moving more towards the your right-hand side of the screen in uh, cloud analytics, real-time data will likely be built inside containers. Now, we're not saying that everything is going in that direction, right? There are definitely a place for traditional applications, right? Uh, expect these things to be around for a long time. But it is emerging, and it is important for us to recognize that these two things will be living together for quite some time, and it will be the job of IT operations to be able to leverage their infrastructure to support both. Now, the four forces that are shaping the trends in the industry that are working with cloud-native applications are DevOps, Agile, containers, and microservices. Now, to some degree, actually to a large degree, right, these are buzzwords today. Uh, I would, it would be hard-pressed to find somebody in this room that didn't find probably at least one, two, and most likely three of these words told to them by some manager in the company within the last week. I would be shocked if that was uh, not the case. But the reason for that is, is that the companies that can successfully pull this off are deploying cloud-native applications at scale and actually helping use the software that they're creating in order to drive business line changes, to, to, to drive value for their customers. <clears throat> and the way that they successfully do that is through what is called the DevOps culture, right? The embracing of rapid change. Now, Oftentimes, DevOps culture and these kinds of you know, rapid change is associated with companies like Twitter and Google. And these companies need to adopt and change very, very quickly. On the other hand, they're also, they have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of the greatest you know, engineers in the world that they can hire and pay, a, you know, pay really, really well to make sure that their, their purpose-built platform is up and running all the time. And not all of us have that luxury. But we, there are still things that we can do to embrace and move more towards this type of culture. And VMware, uh, the, some of the stuff that we talked about, that was talked about in the keynote and that we'll go over today, hopefully will help show you how do you can get there. Now, in addition to DevOps, another uh, uh, piece of technology that is, that is out there that is often spoken about is containers. Now, containers have actually been around for a long time. Um, this is something that is often repeated. What is not often as repeated is that containers actually came about and became in use and became, we'll say, in vogue by companies like Google, not as a development tool, but as an operations tool. Now, that is not actually, that is not actually self-evident, mostly because something that we'll talk about next actually made it so that it became one of the more important development tools to come around in many years, and that's, of course, Docker. But actually what containers did for operations is do some of the things that were actually I, I worked on in another life and, um, in, uh, in a product that still exists with, with VMware or something like ThinApp, right? The idea that you can isolate poor file systems and processes of an application, in that case it was Windows, but the isolation, the portability, and the independent packaging, that was a really powerful tool for Windows with ThinApp, and it's a very powerful tool for de DevOps in the Linux environment. But again, it's an operations, it was an operations tool at first, and the reason was is that Google starts up over two billion containers per week, and that was like two years ago. I imagine it's even more now, that number. I mean, how do you... But in order to, to scale to that amount of, 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 of operations is not something for developers. It's something for operations. Now, Docker, on the other hand, is... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, the oper Let's see. I'm going to find out where did I skip one. Somewhere. Oh, my bad. Um, uh, the... the uh, Now, the IT operations that can pull off the switch to a DevOps culture and um, embrace uh, agility and container applications can actually be become some of the most highest performing um, groups in, in, in the industry, right? They have fewer failures, faster recovery time, and more frequent deployments with shorter lead times. 
And the reason that they have this is because they have embraced the idea of being able to create distributed, um, distributed services across their architecture. And one of the things that they used to do this is they move from a monolithic layered application to a microservices um, application. Now, I've been trying to think of a good analogy for this because you know the way that most of us interact with applications unless we're actually developing it is I have an, I have email. Now I know how email works, right? But all of the necessarily the pieces of it, if unless you deal with it all the time, you may not be familiar with. Now when it actually came to me with a conversation with my uh, my fiance when we were looking at buying a house, right? She's an architect, and I was buying a house, and I live in them. Um, I wanted so many bedrooms, so many bathrooms, you know, how many floors it would be, you know, I knew some things about going up and down the stairs and how I would live in it. She actually thought about bricks and mortar, how old the electrical was, how these things were built up, if we were going to buy a new house, all of the pieces and all the things that have to be built onto that. That's something about the way that I like to think about the way microservices work. Smaller but independent pieces that can be scaled are autonomous and resilient. Right? Those are the things that work from or the way that microservices work with applications. Those are the pieces, the building blocks. Slightly different than the building blocks that I had in my head, the way that many applications were built today. But if you think about them as independent pieces, you can see how they can fit together in many, many different ways. And if you can make them, the pieces, uh, resilient, scalable, and move around, um, you can truly increase the, the rapid deployment of applications. And now here's the slide I was looking for earlier, which is why d um, containers became a developer tool with Docker. Excuse me a second. And Docker changed the way people thought about containers to the point where in many ways they are now, uh, they are now synonymous. They plugged right into the developer lifecycle environment, right? Um, when, and a developer would sit down, code something on their laptop, and have confidence that whatever they created had all of the dependencies that it needed and would be portable without the environment. It also changed the way that people thought about operating systems, right? So when you look at RHEL 7 or something like that, right, or, or Windows, these are big operating systems that made sure that whatever a developer needed was in there, right? They were, they were large, they had all the libraries, they had all of the stacks that you would need for I.O. But now, um, if, you're, if your application developer has the control over what is needed and can say, oh, I'm going to build my application with the pieces that it needs, it can, the developer is now in control of updating. It doesn't have to worry about necessarily what's going on and how often it's going to get patched. The developer has control over um, uh, optim optimizations if it needs to, rapid changes, because all it has to do is build that, the, the new stack. And this is why it is such a powerful tool, right? Um, an another important thing for, uh, uh, with respect to this, this operating system change, this is, I'm sorry, with respect to the operating system change, this is why you're seeing a shift to things like CoreOS or our Photon um, operating system that uh, was released in open source in April and talked about during the keynote today. Because if you're going to put the developer in charge of the things that it needs, you can truly slim down uh, what an op the operating system looks like. Also means that you, can, um, that you can use infrastructure to optimize things like how fast it boots up, right? How, how um, the, the footprint of these, of, of these operating systems and make them incredibly efficient. But at the same time, right, now you have all of these developer tools and you have the operating system and, um, and, and uh, applications and microservices, you still need infrastructure to run on it, right? And as we discussed earlier, the monolithic applications that were built or previously or legacy applications or actually I'm just going to go ahead and say at this time business critical applications because many of the people in this room, you know, whatever you want to call them in the buzzwords, they're still business critical applications. Database applications, payroll applications, distribution applications, those are still mission critical, right? And they need to be able to be able to run efficiently side by side with whatever it is that you're building because people are, as Carl said earlier today, being pushed to drive down their capital and their operational costs. So how do you do that? 
it's not necessarily going out and saying every time you need to change your application sets that you build a new data center or you, in, or you spend you know, hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars on a new infrastructure to support that one set of applications. So VMware and the cloud native applications in the data center was, was, uh, was created and announced last year. Kit Colbert did a lot of talking about it, and he has a super session later today that I, I encourage you to attend. But really, the mission of our group is to make sure, and, and the tools that we're building, is to make sure that customers that want to move to more towards an agile and efficient DevOps model can do that by leveraging their existing infrastructure. I'll bet you I have repeated that three times so far today. I, if I, I'm hoping to do it mo many, many more times because I want you to remember that. that we would like, we want, VMware believes that you should embrace the, uh, the things that make DevOps and make agility and make cloud nat native applications successful, but be able to do it by, with uh, leveraging your existing um, infrastructure for efficiency. And we're going to do that by making the developer a first-class user of the data center, right? Remember what I said earlier about DevOps being a cultural change between IT and app dev? In order to do that, you have to, you have to be able to raise the visibility, the, um, the governance, the, the structure and the process around how applications um, are delivered into the data center, and you have to be able to embrace the agility in order to do that. So the first thing we're going to do is turn the data, uh, is, is uh, part of our mission, is turn the data center into an API, right? Elevate infrastructure abstraction to expose developer-centric concepts and build to support open systems and standards. Now, these things right here, this mission statement, if, you, if we do it, if done correctly, you can embrace uh, you know, each one of these across our initiatives. But right now we're going to focus on turning the data center into an API. Now, this was something traditionally that uh, platform vendors have not been very good at, right? But certain technology uh, drivers within the industry and changes um, have forced not just VMware, uh, but, but other people to embrace the idea of actually uh, turning the infrastructure uh, into an API. Sorry, I'm going to check. My timer's not working here. Okay. And the way that we did that was uh, first was with last year was the OpenStack API, right? So Carl talked earlier today about um, em embracing. Uh, embracing flexibility and openness within VMware and having it being part of our culture. And traditionally, that was making sure that you could run any operating system and any application on the VMware infrastructure, creating the largest ecosystem, uh, one of the largest ecosystems you know, to date in virtualization, making an open platform that would be inviting for, uh, for storage vendors and networking vendors. And VMware integrated OpenStack was another example of that. Tightly integrating VMware's SDDC offering with best of breed compute networking and storage and with partners that had, you know, that were using open source uh, products. This has helped many of our customers scale beyond what they could traditionally do with vCenter. It's allowed it so that they can shift the way that operations are done to CLI and API based and customize the way that they were doing their large scale deployments. But Beyond that, right, beyond that first step, um, well, we, we also need to look at what we're doing in the space of vSphere integrated containers. And this is one of the, the concepts that if you were, hopefully if you were uh, stuck around for the, uh, uh, the keynote that we are going to hit on a lot in the next few days is, is the idea of, of container APIs as part of the v VMware uh, infrastructure. Yeah, for those of you with cameras, this is the one you want to take a picture of. Actually, there's going to be a couple, but this is one of them. So the idea behind vSphere integrated containers is saying, you know what? You have an emerging system. 
you have an existing set of software defined uh, resources, how do you unite these technologies, right? How do you create the portability, speed, and agility, as well as in, uh, enabling security and governance? <clears throat> also, resilience, right? One of the things that I have uh, learned over the past few months talking to customers is that it sounds really great to go and embrace the DevOps and the microservices and the agility. That's, that's great. And one of the things that makes uh, some of the really large-scale systems like Twitter successful is, is that they do this by, and, and they can, they can, um, they wrap, uh, you know, they, they never go down. They're completely resilient applications. Well, that actually is really hard to do. <laughs> And not everybody can do that. But they still might want, with their application sets, but they still want to embrace the agility. Which means that having your um, storage uh, resilient, right? Having DRS, HA, uh, disaster recovery services available within your infrastructure and your applications is important as you move on this journey. Well, those are all the traditional values that you see with virtualization in vSphere. So uniting these technologies and raising the containers to the first class data center and uh, having the ecosystem to support that will be an important, uh, is an important goal, an important part of our mission. And then one that we are proudly um, on our way there. Now, how do you do this, right? One of the ways that we do this is with something called, uh, or that we announced at DockerCon earlier this year, something called uh, Project Bonneville. Now, what we call this when it won't be called Project Bonneville when it actually moves into production, but the idea behind it um, is, is fundamental to, to everything that we're going to talk about with vSphere and operator containers. And it's raising the ESXi host to being a container host. It's taking the infrastructure and making it so that the developer can interact with it, right? Um, everything that ESXi has become known as a VM container, right? Now, there is some, um, there's a lot of uh, people that think that the VM necessarily uh, is, uh, is an older way of isolating things and, and heavy and, and, and whatnot. But the truth of the matter is, is a VM is just an abstraction of resources, right? Just happened to be called a virtual machine for a long time. But whatever, if you, and you need to be able to have resources in order to run containers. So however you make that, right, uh, what, what you make of that is, is actually the important part of the efficiency. So you take the efficiency, you, know, you make the, take the VM and you make it efficient, you allow the developer to run into it or to interact directly with it. And what you get is um, what we've developed with Photon OS, right? Photon OS has a disk footprint of 25 megabytes. Um, there are other there are other distributions that we are or, uh, other forks that we have a photon that are larger, but the minimum that you could use in order to run containers is 25 megabytes. That's really small. Now, one of the things that this you know, this enables, right, is is that if you take this with Instant Clone, last year called VM Fork, or Project Fargo for those of you who followed, anybody recognize any of those terms? Um, I don't actually have a lot, uh, I have a, few, a slide on that, but there's an excellent session on uh, instant clone technology and how it all works and the guts behind it. I think it's on Wednesday. I encourage you to go to that one too. But if you take a 25 meg disk footprint operating system and you couple that with Project Fargo or instant clone, now you can power on a VM in less than a second with an overall memory, initial memory footprint of zero. Right? Now, when you start doing that on a host, it, it, it allow, you can start thinking in your head about how much you can scale up now, right? Scale well, well beyond what you would normally think of on a single host with traditional VMs. And if you add these together, you get the just enough VM, right, that Ray, uh, Ray and Kit talked about earlier today. An instant clone, we'll just give a quick overview, right, is uh, ready to use resources um, with, which includes the CPU, the memory, and the disk, and scale out application-ready pre-registered VMs. Now, the short version of how this works is it's a lot like uh, vMotion on the host. You can take it, you, you do a, 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 you spin up a new copy of the VM, 
but instead of moving it from one location to another, you just keep it on the same VM, so it's, or on the same host. So it's registered, optimized, and incredibly fast. <clears throat> but then, of course, you also need a, a secure container runtime. Right? And have, is anybody here uh, familiar with Photon? Raise of hands. Oh, okay. Um, I encourage you to go and download this. This one is really fun, right? This is uh, an open source project that we released in April. It has been forked many dozens of times already. Um, I think we are, if we haven't already announced, and I'm going to be in trouble for, for breaking the rules, I believe the, the 2.0 version became uh, available to the general public in, uh, in, in GitHub uh, within the last week. But what it is is it is a container-optimized Linux operation uh, uh, OS where we have optimized it for container runtimes, including Docker and Rocket. It's part of the vSphere integrated container story. We're, and, and we're also integrating it very tightly with ESX. We're looking at some of the things that, we're, that our partners, like Intel, is doing with uh, projects called, oh man, it's escaping me right now. Open containers, I think, and where you can you can take optimizations that have been done in VTD and proven for virtualization and leverage those in order to launch the VMs even faster. Also, it comes with updates from VMware. It is supported while it's open source. The updates, the security patches, anything that you would need, even for a small you know distribution, we like to make sure that we're on top of things because our enterprise customers demand it. It's part of the governance that I was on security I was talking about earlier. It's updated by VMware and maintained by VMware, but is an open source project available for customers to, to use. So the next thing we're going to talk about is, OK, that's a great story, Aaron. Thank you for that. But. Um, if I take my vCenter and I make containers um, independent entities within my vCenter, how is that going to scale? My Greenfield application and the initiatives that my CIO and my CTO have set down for us includes millions of containers, and that is going to break your vSphere environment in a matter of minutes. I don't have time for that. What do you have for me? Well, that was the next part of the, the next piece, right? of the story, which is the introduction of Photon Platform. The Photon Platform continues on the story of making the developer a first-class center, citizen of the data center, right? It leverages in-house tools and things that we built, but is supposed to be in developer-centric concepts, but is intended to scale to what we, you know, internet scale or to millions or hundreds of thousands of containers. Now, to be perfectly honest with you, I've traveled around, I've talked to a lot of customers, and there are very few of them that, that, that have actually the requirements that, meet, that need to meet with Photon containers. Most of our customer base, as they, as they are going on this journey, right, the idea of a journey will be um, the integrations, the advancements that we put in with vSphere 6.0, the advancements that are coming out that you can talk, hear about in your TAM sessions or in your NDA sessions with product managers like myself today will help give you the assurance that vSphere integrated containers with a one-to-one -one mapping of a container to a VM will help you on that journey. But, but for those of you that are pushing the boundaries today and looking to VMware to say, how can I get there today with my, I've already embraced DevOps, I've already moved in this direction, you know, we are trying to spin up 50,000 containers or more every day. We have something for you, too. And it is uh, the far side, right? Cloud native platform, Photon platform. It's purpose built for containers. It's got a just what you need feature set, meaning that you don't interact with it the way that you would with vCenter. It doesn't have a lot of bells and whistles. It's not going to. Um, it doesn't have a UI today. You interact with it with a CLI. But what it is is it's federated, API-driven, and very, very high scale to adapt to a high turnover, right, where you're going to spin up hundreds of thousands of, um, of VMs 
in a matter of weeks and turn them over very quickly. They don't live very long, but they are important. They, they live, they die. You want to be able to track them. Now, I don't know, for those of you that didn't hear at the keynote, we are planning to open source um, uh, Photon Platform. So that management tool, that federated management tool, will be open source. Um, we haven't given a date for that yet, but um, you know, I think that that is a, a fairly uh, important announcement. So, so keep your eye on that one. Uh, because as you, even as you move right to what you can manage today, leveraging vSphere 6.0 and vSphere integrated containers, it is something that you will want to, you know, you might want to play with, right? And the fact that we have open sourced it and made it APIs, there are tool sets and, and governance and, and whatnot that you can start looking at today as you move on your journey. This is another way to look at things, right? On your left hand side, I'm sorry, your left hand side, you have ESXi with Photon OS that we talked about on top of it, managed by vCenter with vSphere integrated containers, making it so that the developer has direct access into vCenter to spawn off VMs. So in the keynote today, just, for the, just to make sure, because there were several, I, I know that, uh, that it was at the end and ran long and I was hungry too. What that means is, is that a developer can sit down, type its commands, create its application set, and spin up a number of web applications, for instance. And when they look at it, they will see, hey, I've got my five containers up and running. And at the same time, an IT person can look at their screen and they can see five what would they would call VMs or first class citizens, things that they can manage, things that now they have access, that they can look at through all of their operations tools, all the things that you get through the SDDC, right? All the management tools that you have built, leveraging NSX if you wish, vSAN for um, persistent data if you wish. All of those things work as you would expect when you have your container, or, uh, as you would expect in a uh, first class citizen to live within your management um, tool set. And then, of course, on your right-hand side, you have Photon Machine, right? Photon Machine is uh, built with Photon operating system as well as a just enough version of ESX as well. So if you think about what you live on with the right-hand side, some of the things you may not need that, you would live, that would live within ESX, for instance, oh, most of tools, right? because you don't necessarily aren't going to have a console that's going to give you a UI. So you can just get into the VM with, through a CLI command. Uh, MKS becomes um, uh, less important, right? Mouse, keyboard, and, and screenshots. And on top of that, of course, you build, uh, you can optimize that for running the Photon operating system. And then Photon Controller, the developer in the container API, and that right-hand side, as we talked about, will be um, deployed through, parts of it are going to be open source, Photon Operating System, Photon Platform, and parts of it will be sent uh, to, or can be, will be available by prescription as a bundle. The specifics on that, if you guys want to ask me questions at the end of this, and we are going to save a little bit of time, um, I won't necessarily be able to go into, uh, but, but be aware that, that uh, we're, 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 we're custom building something for scale, vast, fast internet scale, and something to leverage the existing tool sets of today. And the problem with the, 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 the thinking behind this is like, okay, well, my operations today are set up for virtual machines, right? Like, this is great, Aaron. I can leverage my application sets. Um, my developers will become first-class citizens. I can utilize my, my management and my optimizations and, and whatnot. But, but today, you know, all, all I really have is, is VMs, and I don't really know, you know, the, 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 all of my clustering and everything I have set up, like clusters are set up for DRS or, or vMotion or, or by lines of business or, you know, something like that, right? So I ask for Mesos application, and I get a set of VMs. Now that, did, that didn't change so much in the, uh, in the demo. Down to develop, that's what, that's what IT sees and is able to deliver, right? But the developers are looking at it going, well, I've got some services and I want to create them and then I've got some resource pools and, and whatnot. Um, but operations is like, well, I still, right, you're giving me, giving me a VM. And uh, 
And this can lead to inefficiencies, right? And it doesn't help with that cultural change that we were talking about earlier, uh, where, where DevOps and IT, uh, DevOps and where IT and application development uh, unite with their technologies and embrace each other's um, changes, right? And instead, you see a lot of time wasted turning VMs into clustered frameworks, or every deployment is different, and you have to customize things. It would be easier if, if this wasn't the case. So we need, what we need to do is we need to introduce uh, a new unit of management. Jeez, excuse me a second. It's another money slide, so you guys can take your pictures. Now, unit of management we're um, exploring is sort of like a cluster. Many containers on demand to your developers, isolated through VMs, highly availability on a virtual re platform that is managing the resources, but controlled and deployed in such a way that when a developer tells you, hey, I need a Mesos framework, you can deliver that framework instead of intelligently, instead of just setting up some VMs, understanding that those are part of the, of the framework that the, that the developer was going for, and pooling them. Instead, you will be able to, um, IT ops will be able to intelligently deliver the clusters. How will we do that? By exposing, um, by exposing the Photon API to the developers, Photon controllers and distributed controllers, um, this will also work for, 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 um, for vSphere. Similarly, you'll be able to manage at the cluster level and be able to have consumption APIs of the frameworks that we will support. IT and operations and the management will be able to deploy the services as they're needed to the machines and be able to intelligently manage across the entire data center. So again, the vision. Make sure that you can leverage your existing infrastructure as you move on this journey. Um, elevate the, uh, the application developers to first-class citizens. Have a one-to-one -one container to resource, man, uh, resource uh, entity, also ref some referred to typically as a VM, so that you can leverage the ecosystem of all of the things that you can see at the solutions exchange and all of the tools and scripts and everything that you've created within your environment um, uh, today. Be able to manage those, uh, those clusters um, as, as, as individual entity and intelligently, the way that today we have created DRS clusters for the applications that needed it, and have all of the functionality uh, for w when it's needed on my journey, right, as I'm, and, uh, you know, I can, hey, on, w on one set of, of my infrastructure that is leveraging VMware, I can say, okay, vSphere, I'm going to want these set of applications even though they're in containers to leverage DRS and HA and vMotion. And this other set is more resilient and it doesn't necessarily need it, and I'm going to manage that with Photon Platform. But all of it can exist within the same data center and the same infrastructure. So it's good stuff, right? Everybody's still here after a half an hour, so it must be going doing something well. Um, but last and not, not least, uh, I want to make sure that um, you know, we don't really want to forget about the developer. Now, there are tools also today um, that uh, you may or may not be aware of, but that can help initiate this, uh, this, this, this DevOps culture, this uniting of technologies. And one of the, first, one of the things that we uh, released earlier this year um, is uh, the App Catalyst architecture, right? Super simple, get it up and running. It's a hypervisor for the desktop. Um, it is API and command line interface driven. It, it has the hypervisor is purpose built. Um, it lives on the Mac, right? So that uh, the developers that are loving the Mac hardware, even if necessarily they're not loving the operating system, can embrace it. Um, it's currently in tech preview, but um, you know, it's free to download. Get your customer, your uh, your developers to go ahead and try it out. Um, it's part of Project Photon. 
um, and it, it so supports the, uh, the Docker machine and uh, integration with Vagrant. The nice thing about this too is, is that when you begin to introduce App Catalyst into the overall idea of Photon, you can see how that you can take things directly from the developer left, uh, laptop and plug it directly into the vSphere integrated container framework. So finally, what have we announced? Right? We've announced vSphere integrated containers, a unified hybrid platform that exists with VMware, with vCenter, that makes, that elevates uh, the developer to first class citizen. It's got extensions into vSphere, supports running your applications, whether they're container based or, t or, or, uh, or, or legacy. They're built for compatibility. Has the bro it supports the broad feature set, right? So integrated containers with, with Project um, Bonneville, as well as uh, instant clone technologies will allow you to uh, be quickly be able to, your developers to quickly be able to spin up container-based applications on your platform. As well as VMware Photon Platform, which is brand new technology built by VMware for VMware customers to scale to very large environments built with IPA uh, or uh, API automation sets but with can with just enough feature set and is uh, available will be available by subscription um, with specifics and prices pricing and packaging available later this year now several of these are available in the hands-on lab actually for you to try out also so I would encourage people that uh, that have some time um, to try that out, right? So I think that uh, Photon Platform is available as well as uh, vSphere Integrated Containers. Both are available in the hands-on lab. And again, just in case you missed the picture earlier, this is the vSphere Integrated Containers. The idea of leveraging vSphere, um, plugging in Project Bonneville so that you can quickly spin things up and be able to leverage the entire ecosystem. So, um, that's how you get a hold of me. Um, GitHub address for those of you who want to go and download uh, Pro Project Photon, the operating system. You will also find Project Lightwave there. We've op um, Lightwave is uh, open source and also known to some of you either friendly or unfriendly, depending on which version you're on, as uh, SSO. Um, App Catalyst, get appcatalyst.com. And, uh, you know, ser like, I, I honestly and truly encourage you this year to, to try things out in the hand, hands-on lab. If you want to know more about how containers work, what do your developers that you're working with look at, it's something it's very important tool to look at. Um, and uh, the, I think we're also we're running containers uh, on um, Prince of Persia. Prince of, we have Prince of Persia running in a gaming center uh, at Moscone West um, inside DOS containers, which is, which is pretty cool, uh, just from a technology point of view. Last year it was uh, 3D vGPU, this year containers in Prince of Persia, but getting more and more into the gaming idea of, of participating in VM world. And finally, um, I, this is an idea of, I'm going to leave this one up for a while, you guys can come, well, come take a look at it. Things I would encourage you to look at, Kit Colbert later on is doing a, uh, um, um, a CTO session, a super session on, on uh, vSphere integrated containers, so you can hear more about that. Um, uh, Alan, uh, one of my colleagues of product management, Alan uh, Renault, is, is, uh, is giving uh, a very good talk on, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, an instant clone and command line of instant clone and how you can intera interact with that and how it, and the, 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 a deep dive as to how it works. Uh, on Wednesday, I also believe there's a, there's a very good session on um, storage independently where uh, one of my colleagues named Vivek will be doing a whole session on our announcements around uh, uh, vSAN and uh, storage group and support for Flocker. Oh, what else am I missing? Oh, uh, Jared Rusoff is doing a, a talk later on today. Um, or actually, I think it's Wednesday. Uh, on, on specifics around uh, the Photon platform, as well as Dan Wenlund on Thursday. So all of those are things that I encourage you to check out. So um, 
again, thank you very much for coming and being a gracious audience. I have about 10 minutes uh, to take questions. If you would like to ask a question, please step up to the microphone since uh, this is being saved for posterity. You said that uh, the, the OS, Photon OS, was going to be uh, open source, but the platform was going to be a, a paid product? Uh, vSphere, so Photon Operating System mm -hmm. is already an open source project. So the small Linux distribution that um, you see today is available on GitHub and as an open source project. Um, VMware Platform, the management portion, um, will be uh, available open source later this year, but I don't know the date yet. Because you said something about a subscription service. Is that so there's going to be a, there, if you, um, in the keynote today, there wa there's going to be an option of a release of a full stack that is supported and put together by VMware, as well as one that goes out with um, a Cloud Foundry, but the specific pricing and packaging of that hasn't been announced. Thank you. So with the integrated platform, how can you are hold you on one second? If you're not if you're not gonna ask a question or you're not concerned about the question and can you take your conversations outside, it's very difficult to hear. Thank you. With the integrated platform, um, how are you handling static volume maps? I'm sorry, I can't. So uh, for volumes, uh, Docker volumes and things like that, uh, if you have static resources, uh, ah. like you know, might be served up via NFS. Uh, is there a possibility of having like a VVOL assigned for yes, static content? there actually okay. is. And the details of all of the storage will, will be done by, by uh, my colleague uh, uh, Vivek. I can s show you specifically to the, to the session. He's doing a whole hour long one on, on that. I would very much like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's, a good, it's a good talk. It goes into even some of the demo that Kit, Kit did earlier today. Uh, let's see, where is it? No. I'll, I'll hang out a second, I'll find it for you. For the vSphere integrated containers, is there any, what's the scaling numbers on that? vSphere integrated containers? Yeah, for that version. For on on vCenter? Yeah. We haven't, uh, uh, it hasn't actually been officially re released yet, mm -hmm. um, and we're still working on doing the performance data. We expect, though, that uh, with the efficiency of what we're being able to do with, doc with um, Photon mm -hmm. and with um, uh, Instant Clone, that it will be able to scale to meet the majority of our customers' needs. That's why we're creating both stacks, right? Just to be able to say, okay, on one hand, what you'll be able to do with your existing environment will scale to meet our existing needs, and we will continue to innovate uh, in the area of delivering uh, scale for vCenter, but at the same time saying, okay, well, if you're moving in that environment today, Photon Platform may fit your need a little bit better. And for the Photon Platform, is there plans for NSX integration or? I'm sorry? For NSX integration with the Photon Platform? Oh, yeah. Um, if you, if the, the, um, the idea behind that is, is that what you will see is it will still be built on the, 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 the structures of, of, what, of, of our software-defined data center. Okay. Um, you know, what, you, what you will do when, when it's built on ESX and all those other pieces will be able to fit into it. But uh, what that looks like will evolve over time. Hi, a little more of a bit more general question. Um, are you guys going to be pursuing? Uh, I'm sorry, sir, I can't for hear. Pursuing you. automation and DevOps. Are is VMware going to be coming out with PowerCLI native to Linux for those of us who aren't Windows admins, or going yes, to be? Yes, there's actually a session on that too. Or enhancing, say, Python APIs so we can have something a little more. Are general you talking there. about um, the CLI directly into vCenter? In general, yes. So yes, that is that, that that is a part of our plan, and there is a session on that as well um, coming out uh, the, the, in the next couple of days by one of the gentlemen that's also doing the um, uh, the instant clone session. Instant clone. I can okay. I can point you to his name. Because there's as well. a there's a session on Power CLI, Power CLI, but I, I, when I think of that, I think of Windows instead of. Yeah, if we can list. compare notes afterwards, and okay. I'll tell you if that's the one. Okay. 
What's your future roadmap for containers with Windows VMs? Like Windows OS containers. I'm the wrong person to ask that even. Uh, I'm not sure that we're... I don't know whether or not I'm allowed to talk to that in a public forum. <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I have two questions. Sure. Um, the first one is, if we go down a path, right now we're going down a path of Kubernetes and Docker. Mm -hmm. If we go down that path and you know scale that out and everything, what is the, can we seamlessly migrate into Photon or do we got to kind of rip and replace? Photon platform? Yeah, like the Photon the idea is, and all that. Is we're trying to make um, our cloud native story in all instances, and I probably, I don't, I don't know if I hit this one enough, is to be as open as possible. We're not trying to create application, new sets of APIs for our developers to use, right? We want to use uh, the developer tools that they already have today, plug into our, to the infrastructure that you're managing. So if you're embracing Mesos or Kubernetes or Docker or whatever, right, those tools should just plug right into it. That's why we're trying to make, you know, part of Project Bonneville is to make the ESXi host part of a Docker engine so that they can just use whatever it is that they're doing, their existing, uh, their, uh, their existing processes, their existing development aspects, right? You, developers don't like it when you tell them what, what, what to do. <laughs> it's, it's much better if you can be like, okay, that what you are doing to create your application, if that's what fits your needs, it plugs right into the infrastructure. So our goal is to actually expand what uh, Photon Platform supports rather than limit it to some API that we create. Okay, um, the other question I had was the uh, Photon Machine. Mm -hmm. uh, with the Photon Machine, do you still get the NS NSX, like micro-segmentation integration there? I uh, can't. The pricing, the packaging, of, and what actually is going into the, the, the Photon Machine hasn't been uh, okay. disclosed yet. All right, thank you. Look for that over the next few months. Okay, I'd like to thank everyone for coming, and uh, enjoy the rest of the show. <laughs>